Okay. So with that, uh, maybe I'll kick us off. Uh, first, I'd like to say a few words. Uh, welcome to everybody here in the audience, our limited partners, founders, extended Prime Movers Lab family, um, and a special welcome to our new Growth Fund LPs. Uh, as most of you already know, Prime Movers is an early stage deep tech fund uh, that invests in breakthrough scientific inventions that have the ability to transform billions of lives. We're looking at really awesome technologies across energy, transportation, infrastructure, manufacturing, human augmentation, um, and computing. And uh, the purpose behind these webinars is really to share some of the you know, amazing things we get to see on a daily basis uh, and the people doing them um, with you all. Uh, this is emblematic for our PML style, bringing together industry experts, uh, amazing founders, prime movers, changing the world, uh, and sharing that knowledge with the community, um, as well as highlighting some of the important work that's being done out there. Uh, so myself, um, I'm a technical partner here. My background's in chemical engineering. Uh, so it might sound like a long way from quantum computing, but there's more overlap than you might think, which maybe we'll discuss a little bit today. A little bit of housekeeping as well. Um, we're doing these every two weeks, so come back, same time, same place, uh, two Wednesdays from now. We're going to keep this to an hour, and please pile questions into the Q&A or chat at any point during the webinar. Um, we'll start answering those about 40 minutes in. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to David to introduce himself. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Carly. Uh, so I, I am a GP in, uh, in the Growth Fund. Uh, I'm a Silicon Valley guy. I grew up with a father who was part of the Army Navy uh, joint venture that pioneered radar. Uh, he was in Pearl Harbor in World War II and watched two of his friends get shot in the face from the zeros that had come in uh, and swore that he would, you know, kind of create a different defense system. Um, so I grew up at the dinner table very deep in the stack in the telecommunications wars that defined Silicon Valley in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and so I have a uh, a number of different hats that I wear here. Part of it's my nerdy computer self, part of it's a defense perspective, and part of it's a telecommunications and, and uh, all the other uh, elements that, that grow from that um, that uh, make me very interested in this exciting area and trying to figure out what we're, what we're going to do with it in the future. All right. And so with that, um, let's, let's get to the important people and uh, introduce our panelists. So uh, Tatiana, would you like to lead us off, please? Sure, thanks, Carly. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here today with, with all of you uh, and our audience uh, and talk about quantum technologies. Um, uh, my name is Tatiana Kerchik. I am a program manager at DARPA Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency um, here in, in Washington, uh, DC. Um, it's a funding agency um, for technologies uh, of uh, national security, for national security. And I work in the quantum information areas. But in fact, I've been working in quantum information for the past 20 years, a little, a little longer than that. Uh, before DARPA, I was uh, at uh, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, which is also a funding agency um, for basic research, working in the same field. And before that, I was at DARPA um, as a consultant straight out of graduate school. Um, and I also spent a year um, not long ago, a few years ago in industry, um, I was uh, the founding director of Quantum Valley Ideas Laboratories, which is an um, uh, applied research organization for the development of quantum technologies um, in Waterloo, Ontario, in Canada. Uh, currently, I work uh, on quantum computing, but also uh, quantum sensing, uh, as well as clocks, precision timing. So those are sort of my interests. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. I think, and that really speaks to how long research in this field has been going on, going, you know, hearing that long list of uh, experiences and organizations that have been active here. Um, okay, with that, let's switch over to Jonathan. Hey, I'm uh, Jonathan King. I'm a co-founder and lead scientist at Atom Computing. Uh, we're a startup company located in Berkeley, California, working on neutral atoms as a qubit architecture. Um, before uh, joining Adam, I was did both my PhD and my postdoc actually just up the road from where I am now at UC Berkeley. Um, like Carly, I came originally from a chemical engineering background, kind of transmission, transition more into physical chemistry and have kind of ended up all the way on the side of uh, atomic physics right now. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk more about what we're doing at Adam Computing, but I think I'll leave the intro at that for now. Great, thank you, Jonathan. And uh, lastly, I think calling in from the farthest away, Jan, would you like to introduce yourself? 
Yes, uh, of course. Well, I'm I'm calling in from Munich. Um, I don't know how far away that is, um, but anyways, um, so I'm I'm a CEO of one of the co-founders of IQM. Um, we also build quantum computers, but using a different technology platform. Um, so we are using the superconducting um, qubits. Um, I'm a physicist by training. I got my PhD in Munich and then moved to Helsinki in Finland, uh, where I did a postdoc. And basically in this group and in this environment, we at some point realized, okay, we have everything it needs to, to start a company. And then we just did it. And since 2019 now, uh, we are running the company. We are now approaching 100 people around uh, about. Um, and yeah, happy to talk. All right. So there's already a lot of quantum computing words getting thrown around here. David, do you want to lead us off for the uh, first question? Yeah, first question for really anyone who will take it. Um, why don't we start with a definition of what we mean by, by quantum computing? Uh, for, for those of us less well-schooled than all of you guys like me, um, I think about it as simply fast processing, but step function faster processing than anything we've seen today. Um, so the, whether the cat is alive or dead is kind of blurred in the, the process. Um, so can, can someone kind of give us a, a good definition for, for what we investor public should be thinking as defining what quantum computing kind of is today and, and will be in five years as we define it better? Can I cold call uh, Jonathan, how about you? Sure, so yeah, I mean, there, there are a couple questions in there, I mean, so what is quantum computing? I mean, fundamentally that's a technical question, but I'll try to answer it like not technically really. I mean, the thing is, you know, there's sort of a, I guess, theory of, you know, classical computing. When I say classical computing, what I mean is in contrast to quantum computing. Um, you know, this idea of, you know, bits um, being replaced by ideas of qubits. And you've, you know, I think everybody's heard about these ideas, even if we don't want to get into the, uh, the weeds of what they mean, you know, technically, but heard maybe heard of these ideas of qubits or quantum systems having these properties of like superposition and entanglement. And so what yeah, I was gonna got big vocab the vocabulary police are coming out. What is yeah. a qubit? What is a qubit? A qubit is just the quantum analog of a bit. It's a two-level system, much like a bit can be a zero or one. A qubit can be, again, I'm gonna use a word here, a superposition of zero and one. Uh, this is, you know, the idea of the cat being alive or dead or some combination thereof. That's, that's a statement about superposition. I think the main point, though, is that, you know, without getting into the weeds, uh, the mathematical description of the information in a qubit and the transformations that transform a state of many qubits from an initial state to a final state are just fundamentally different than what we have in classical computing. Um, and so for the right algorithms and for the right applications, there is the potential to do much, much more with um, much fewer qubits than bits. And I guess, I guess to maybe zero in on the question you asked, like, is it just faster computing? Um, no, not, not in general. It's a question of certain applications make use of the properties of quantum computing. So for the right applications, um, there is the potential for much, much, much better scalability in terms of how much computational resources you need. Um, it's not necessarily generally faster though. So frame this, uh, and, and Jan, maybe we can cold call <laughs> you. Um, frame this for our LPs who are not deep in the stack, PhDs in physics and or math. Um, mm -hmm. How does this apply in the product sphere? Like what are some of the cool new technology applications we could see where this becomes a thing with a capital T. Uh, you hear a lot about you know, security issues and all the other elements that are inside of there and edge computing and so on and so on. But give us kind of your take on, on where, where we're heading uh, from the commercial side. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, if you have the definite answer to this question, then already uh, we would be much smarter because many people are now, let's say, hunting for the low hanging fruit and asking this question, what will be, let's say, the, the first or one of the first um, applications, because if you list all of them, I think the list is very long that, that have the potential. And it starts from, from chemistry, from op all kinds of optimization problems and, and so on. But these, I mean, you can just pull all the buzzwords, um, but I think that's not the point. The, the real 
question is, okay, which will be the first ones? Because if you think of a computer, so usually when I start explaining quantum computing, I start from the things that people know and most people know a co computer, how it works. And nowadays the computers that we have, let's say a laptop computer, um, you input a, a problem and then it gives you an answer back. And the nice thing okay. of our laptop computers is that basically you could um, program in any problem um, and of course it takes more or less time to get the answer back, um, but it's in this sense universal. Um, but with quantum, at least my assessment is it, it will not start this way, but we will start with very specific problems. Um, and, and in these verticals, you then have a machine that solves this and only this problem and, and all the other ones, it sucks. Um, and um, in, in this sense, it's not a universal computer, but it's more like a application specific simulator for solving this problem. So coming back to the question is, for, for which problem actually will we first build a machine where we generate business value, so to say? Um, and of course, you can ask many people, my bets would really be at the moment either financial, um, some optimization problems in, 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 in finance, um, where it's mostly about portfolio optimization or, or option pricing, or then on the chemistry side. So these would be my bets for the low hang, uh, hanging fruits. But David, if I may, it is important, however, to emphasize that uh, why uh, all the folks like Jan and Jonathan are in the quantum computing field, uh, and that is the ultimate promise is that universal computer, which still might be um, a ways away. We, nobody really knows how, um, how far away it is. Um, but uh, the reason that's exciting is that not because it'll be able to solve certain problems faster than um, conventional computers, but because um, it um, has the promise of solving problems that are intractable for conventional computers, meaning pretty much impossible for conventional no computers to solve. And that's really the, the appeal and the excitement about quantum computing that it, it might be able to solve problems that are impossible today. What's an Whether, example? Like what, walk yeah. us through an example today right. of something that's impossible. Right. So, so what really gave a huge boost to the whole field of quantum computing uh, was Shor's algorithm in 1995. Before that, uh, quantum computing was just this sort of theoretical exercise that a few people were, um, um, you know, keeping busy with. Um, and what Shor's algorithm showed was that with quantum computing, meaning using quantum computing techniques, um, uh, quantum mechanics, qubits instead of the classical bits, uh, one can factor large numbers in polynomial time, uh, meaning efficiently, which you cannot do with conventional computers. That hasn't been proved yet, but we uh, that's been the case so far. So there's one example that we know where quantum computers have an exponential speed up and that, yeah, that's not, that's not the kind of speed up that you get by, you know, the, the sort of Moore's law kind of thing. Um, it is in fact, factoring large numbers is a problem that is uh, intractable for conventional computers, impossible to solve. Meaning if you get a fast enough computer today, you build it, you just add another digit to your number and it's gonna take the life of universe, you know, to, to uh, factorize it, okay, okay. With a quantum computer, that's not the case. And of course, it's an important, it happens to be an important problem because, um, because it's used uh, very widely in cryptography. Uh, the, the fact that factoring large numbers is, is hard to do. Um, in addition to that, there's hope as uh, Jan pointed out that, uh, but no mathematical proofs quite yet. Well, okay, I take that back maybe to, it's very difficult to prove these things strictly, but there is definitely indications that we might be able to do, to have the same kind of advantage for chemistry, for complex materials, and some other classes of problems. Um, so now you're talking about uh, applications to um, pharma, chemical engineering, uh, uh, you know, materials, science, and so on and so forth. Maybe, maybe something something I was reading about when I was trying to I was getting excited about quantum computing and talking to you all was Microsoft gave an example of the nitrogen fixing mm -hmm. enzyme, um, which today you can't you can't make it. It's too hard to recreate that structure with all its crazy folds and stuff. But with a quantum computer that uh, that 
thinks like a molecule, right? That mo the molecule has spins and up and down and all these quantum effects. Now suddenly you could synthetically make that um, and you could uh, replace Haber Bosch and save the world through, you know, not having to pay a bunch for nitrogen and fertilizer and carbon and bad stuff. Um, that was that was one thing that lit me up. I, I also, if you uh, are willing to touch on it, continue for a second. We've got a, a question from the Q and A. Um, I think that gets to what you're talking about with Shor's algorithm and encryption and how the internet is currently secured. Um, will there be re relatively simple hardware products in the next, say, five years um, that could be deployed um, that would address the problem of like quantum computers being able to break? Uh, existing encryption protocols? Or is this a problem that's going to take smart people like you all years and years to figure out and address? Um, and other people, please weigh in. Mm -hmm. So I don't work in this area, but I do know a little bit about it. Um, uh, uh, NIST, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is, among other things, um, uh, in charge of certifying, uh, you know, such, such protocols and equipment for, for security um, is working together with NSA, National Security Agency, and what, what can find, find that information, um, it's readily available. And they have a program currently, a program uh, developing novel, it's called post-quantum cryptography techniques. Now these are uh, classical um, mathematical uh, approaches to develop new encryption methods that don't rely on factoring large numbers. They rely on some other hard problems. And so they are very well, that program has been underway for a few years. Um, I, I, I don't know what stage it's at, but they are very much on top of that. That's, I think that's the NSA and NIST um, uh, main approach for addressing vulnerabilities um, that come from having quantum computers someday in terms of uh, cybersecurity, in terms of uh, cryptography, really. Uh, so it's post-quantum cryptography. Mm -hmm. I could, the short uh, answer, yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, I was just going to add a little, because this, this comes up a lot, like, because I think that there's a couple reasons why, you know, sort of general public latches on to this idea. I think it's because it, number one, Shor's algorithm was actually one of the sort of seminal quantum algorithms that like started the field. So it's one of the first things people knew about. Um, but you know, actually implementing it at a scale or implementing some kind of factorization algorithm at a scale that really causes all these world changing things to happen is probably one of is much, much harder problem than like the chemistry and other things that we're solving. So, so number one, like, I, I guess I just wanted to say, I think people get really hyped up about this, but the ability to actually do that is kind of further out in the future. And like Tatiana was saying, like the smart people are figuring out ways to, to mitigate that problem, you know, the, the security problem when it does happen. So I tend to like, when people actually talk to me about like, what are quantum computers valuable for, or how they will, you know, change the world, like I tend to kind of steer away from that a little bit more and more towards the like, you know, chemistry and optimizations and sort of the things that Jan touched on earlier. Speaking it's of smart so people, Oh, go ahead, uh, Tatiana. If I may, it, it somewhat depends on how long you want to keep your secrets, right? So if you want to keep your secrets for a couple of years, yeah, no worries. We're not going to have a quantum computer uh, capable of, of breaking those encryptions um, uh, uh, that near in the future. But if you want to keep your secrets for 50 years, then well, you, may not, you may want to come up with a, uh, a new crypto scheme soon. Yeah, this is why it's, you know, governments and maybe maybe like very large financial institutions and these kind of people who are really interested in risk mitigation who think about these things. Um, but it's, you know, not as much in my mind part of the conversation for people looking for value in, in the nearer term. Okay, there, there was a really smart person question here that I, re I want to um, acknowledge, which is, will quantum computers we can elliptic curve encryption as well. I don't even know what that is. Do one of you guys, and do you want to take that? Or only factorization-based techniques? This, this, this is, may this be the first one? time we've. Yeah. So this is. Specific question. Yeah, so go ahead, yeah. I mean, this is, I believe one of, again, this is not my area, but I believe this is one of the post-quantum uh, crypto uh, approaches. Um, and I believe the nature of the question is, can quantum computers break that? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, not at this point, but I don't think any of those approaches have information um, 
a, a, a theoretic security, uh, meaning that they can provably be secure against the quantum computer attack. I could be wrong about that, but that is my understanding. But to date, I'm not aware that quantum computers can break any of those. Okay. And just to clarify, elliptic curve encryption, this is a software or math oh. problem-based solution, not a hardware solution to quantum crypto or to cryptography, correct? Yeah, it's a, it's a mathematical approach, right? So it's... Yeah. it's... Okay. Um, maybe Jan, uh, a question from Clark Cheng. If a country solves quantum computing first, is that country able to break any code or password of another country? Would you like to speak to that? I mean, the, the short answer is no, because already the word any in there, uh, we just discussed there, there are these uh, quantum secure codes. And yeah, usually also, I, I agree with Jonathan that usually I try to explain the value of quantum and breaking in encryption, for me at least, it doesn't add a lot of value. But for me, the motivation to do this is really to find something to make the world a better place. So, I don't know, develop algorithms for um, better materials or, or medicine or these kind of things. And the, um, I think it's also a timeline question as Tatiana mentioned, of course, there is a lot of motivation maybe to go into the security aspect, but it's so far down the road that also it doesn't really fit to the typical timelines of a, of a startup company. So for me, these are things that are very far away and maybe in, in five, 10 or whatever years we, we talk about them, but I usually have different motivators to do quantum computing. Would you like to elaborate on your on your motivators and, and what problem you're most excited about solving? Well, I think some of them we heard already, like this, um, yeah. uh, the carbon capture or, or, or finding. I'm, I'm really also, I like this optimization when it comes to, let's say, improve practical matters of life. So, for example, um, traffic optimization. Um, at least I've been living in, in larger cities. And then if you if you are uh, every day uh, are in a traffic jam, um, I think this is something that annoys you. And I think this is something where quantum computers might impact the life of, of all of us without us even knowing, because usually when 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 these, let's say, traffic systems are being optimized, the, the people on the streets, they don't recognize that in the background, there's maybe a big computer um, running. And I think in, in this sense, there, there will be in the future many aspects where hopefully we will see positive impact without even noticing that there's a quantum computer because usually, I don't think it will run soon in our smartphones or our laptop computers. Okay, well, so who buys, who is buying the quantum computer? Who, who are you selling them to? If this is just hiding in the background, like managing traffic, right? Like who, who is buying these computers or, um, and, or time on them or how does that work? And how does this actually get into our, our lives if it's not gonna make us look like the Jetsons? Well, I, I can just continue briefly and then I, I leave room for others. So for me, they belong into the supercomputing center. So for me, quantum computing is, a, let's say, a, a sub group of high performance computing. And um, usually often people then use the word quantum accelerator, which means that you have similar, for example, what you see in AI, where you, you have the graphical um, processing units, which accelerate. Um, the algorithms, this is one way to see quantum computers as well, where basically if you have a bigger problem and then at some point of the algorithm, you hit a point where it becomes really complicated, then you say, okay, maybe this part goes to the quantum computer and then it solves it and, and feeds it back. And, and this is the way I see it. So for me, the answer is they, they go to the big supercomputing centers and whoever buys the computers there will also buy the quantum computers. Okay. Just... Now I'm curious, how many supercomputing clusters are there in the world? Like, is this something where you, you sell one computer a year for $10 million? Or is this something where there's these numbers, these computing facilities are going to increase and this is actually a, a you know, billion dollar a year market? Any thoughts on that? I know it's early. I guess I can answer from maybe from our perspective a little bit. I mean, yeah, we, you know, we, we, we think of it as more, I mean, uh, so first of all, yeah, from our perspective, like who are the customers? I mean, I think we think of it more as, you know, a cloud-based system, like, uh, you know, like I, I often say, like sort of the equivalent of like Amazon Web Services or something like that. So, you know, any user can log on and get time, get computing time um, on our systems. And who do I, I mean, and so like who the customers are and what the market is depends on what, you know, applications uh, you can, you can actually show. I mean, of course, in the nearer term, it's, it's more research. It's more people who, you know, don't necessarily, like, I, I don't know, I tend, I tend to default to chemistry because that's more related to my background. I mean, even if, 
you know, the quantum computers of today have not yet solved, you know, chemistry problems like, you know, replacing the Haber-Bosch process or whatever, um, there it's still worthwhile for institutions and companies to invest time into understanding how they will use quantum computers effectively uh, in the coming years. Uh, but that being said, like, you know, I think chemical companies, pharmaceutical companies, you know, I would say institutions and large organizations that are already, you know, make use of high performance computing to solve problems. Uh, these are the same kinds of people. And so of course, you know, just, just chemistry and pharmaceuticals alone, for example, is, is you know, a big market. So can I, can I interject here? We've yeah. had uh, chemistry, pharmaceuticals, Wall Street, you know, predictive analytics for algorithms or trading yeah. options, derivatives and so on. None of that's new. It's all been around for a really long time. History is littered with basically what you've described as timeshare computing. You have yeah. a big mother server. DEC was one of them. They went bankrupt in 1987. Uh, Cray computers went bankrupt in 1994. They were bought by Sun Microsystems and Bay almost or Silicon Graphics and almost drove them into bankruptcy. Um, there have been myriad uh, giant next gen, next level speed and processing computers that have been kind of this great salvo. But had you invested in any of them and held them a while, you would have lost everything. There hasn't yet been this quantum leap forward that we all keep expecting. It happens in pockets and in pits. IBM every now and then comes up with something that I don't know, beats a really good chess player. Um, Google's had a few of these things that are cool. Um, but how do you think about the, the next kind of element where commercial traction is easily realizable rather than you know something else? And I'm kind of echoing the question from Dylan Richards uh, who had asked, what are the, the main technical breakthroughs that are necessary to reach commercialization for quantum computing? So I'm kind of harping on this a little bit because we could talk about the theory of what might happen for a lot, but I think our audience is going to be interested in how we're, we're putting their money to work, at least in, in some part, and, and helping us with the mega trend to identify with all of this. So does anyone have any like particular thoughts on why this time is different with quantum computing versus what happened with Cray and, and the others? I mean, I guess... Um... You know, the, the people, you know, these companies or organizations, and I wouldn't claim to know the history of all of them in detail, you know, it, it wasn't that people gave up on the idea of using high performance computing, it's that they found other places to get what they needed. And I, I would assume that, I would assume that has to do with just like, you know, the technology advancing rapidly, uh, et cetera. I mean, I, I guess I, I link back, I think more along the lines of you know, not these really specific instances where if it's Cray or whomever um, offering something that then sort of went by the wayside, I think of something like, you know, cloud, cloud-based computing is here to stay. Like, I'm not, I'm not worried about Amazon Web Services dying. It's, you know, it's easy to access. It provides value to many, many people. And, you know, it's just so ubiquitous that, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not worried about that just being passed by. And, you know, from my standpoint, it's like, when quantum computers get to the point that they really are offering the value, solving these problems, chemistry optimization, or whatever they are, I mean, I think it's, the real question is the technology. Like, I'm not, I'm not worried about people wanting to interact with computer, quantum computers and wanting to get to pay for them wanting to get value from them. I think the real, you know, questions are who has the best technology? Like if, if one technology is winning and just working the best, then, you know, I think, I think that's what determines, um, in terms of winner in the sense. So what I've, what I've heard is different now is actually the access in mm -hmm. that Amazon Web Services and these others have just made access to whatever technology is the best so easy. Like you don't have to have armies of salespeople across the country trying to sell you a Cree computer versus a IBM or something like that. In theory, one could just log on. And if you can get access to these main major providers, the distribution channels have changed a lot. 
um, maybe I think where the where the root of that why now question came from though was what are the technical breakthroughs that are necessary for these things to be useful? So maybe we could we could touch on that question <laughs> where you know where are we today? Where do we need to be for this stuff to be useful? Yeah, I mean, I, I could just continue and then then I'll pause and I'll let whoever else wants to go next. But yeah, I mean, it's a lot of really interesting stuff has happened in quantum computing. You know, a lot of the building blocks have been demonstrated um, and sort of understanding where we are and kind of where we need to get to. And, you know, something we haven't really touched on yet is fault tolerance, error correction, and kind of like reaching this threshold where you can start operating your quantum computer as though it uh, as though it doesn't have errors, um, errors in it. And so <clears throat> in a short answer- Maybe let's dial back a minute to the building blocks. <laughs> like yeah. what building blocks do we need? And then we can talk about how they have errors all over the place. We, 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 need, we need larger scale systems, you know. Uh, we still need orders of magnitude, more qubits um, and operating with low error rates to get to the point where we can really implement the long-term goals where thing where, where those things like error correction become possible and some of the really, really high value applications uh, become possible. And, and so it's an interesting question, what technological breakthroughs are needed? Um, it depends on what your, your specific technology is because you know um, neutral atoms are physically a very different system than superconducting qubits or anything else. So you know from our, from our standpoint at atom computing, it's developing these sort of um, ways to trap and manipulate atoms optically such that you can scale up to large, large numbers of qubits, uh, large numbers of atoms behaving as qubits um, without giving up um, on high fidelity. High fidelity meaning low error rates, basically. And maybe we can just put in a context, how many bits do we have now? Or qubits, sorry, how many qubits do we have now and how many do we need? And maybe um, I'm going to cold call uh, Tatjana because I know you work with maybe smaller numbers of qubits and some of the others to try to make them useful. Yeah, uh, listening to this portion of the conversation discussion, I'm, I'm afraid that we might disappoint our audience here uh, because we don't have the answer to the question, when are we going to have a useful quantum computer? I mean, that's really the big question here. We know we're not going to have a universal fault tolerant quantum computer for a while, and we don't even know how long that's going to be, but, but probably a long time. But even with these imperfect, noisy quantum processors, quantum computers, they're called NISC, noisy intermediate scale quantum uh, devices, we don't know how many qubits of what quality we're going to need to do to solve a useful problem. So I have a program um, currently on addressing optimization problems, kind of things that Jan brought up earlier. And we're trying to not even solve a useful problem. We know we're not gonna be able to do that in, 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 in just the, the lifetime of the program, which is uh, four years, but even to just by the end of the program, figure out what it takes to solve a useful size and a useful problem better than what we can do uh, with conventional computers. So I'm saying all of this uh, to point out that at this point in time, I don't think we know how many, we know we're gonna need more qubits than we have today. And it's not just about more qubits, it's also about the quality of qubits as Jonathan pointed out. And today um, we have 10 to 50 qubits, is that a fair, are we beyond that at this point? Well, so um, a group at Harvard working on the same uh, approach as Jonathan's company, they have 300 qubits, right? Uh, and that's a, new, that's a new approach. There's only a couple of companies around in the US that are pursuing this approach right now. One is, one is Adam Computing, um, Jonathan's company, so, but, but uh, you know, you still have very imperfect noisy qubits and gates, and can you do anything useful with that in the, in the next couple of years? We'll find out. We don't know. But, but you've seen probably a, a number of companies now have published roadmaps, and those are pretty amazing. I think everybody's seen the IBM roadmap. Um, and I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but we're talking, they're talking about a thousand qubits in a few years in superconducting. Uh, Jan, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, 
But notice they're not talking about fault tolerant qubits uh, necessarily or demonstrating that in, in that amount of time. So there will be, I think you will see in the next uh, few years, uh, quite an increase in the number of qubits in various systems. I think you'll see it in superconducting. I, I think you'll see it in trapped ions and certainly neutral, neutral atoms. Um, you'll probably see better quality of these qubits as well. What we don't know yet is where is that point where we'll be able to do something better than what we can do today. And so maybe you've mentioned, you've all mentioned um, like error prone qubits. So what problems need to be solved to keep, to make these qubits error free so they become useful is that and and correct me if that's not the right question to ask but i see a lot of you know what problems need to be solved for a universal quantum computer um things to that questions along those lines so let me start from sort of a high level and then i'll um hand it off to the experts really uh the power of quantum computing uh as pointed out before has to do with the um tapping into quantum correlations like entanglement. Somebody mentioned entanglement. That does not exist in, with conventional bits. And it's a really powerful physical resource, completely new. And we're at a point technologically, at a point in time over the past couple of decades where we actually can control and manipulate nature at a single particle level and tap into that amazing resource. However, that resource is incredibly fragile. <laughs> you know, these quantum correlations and quantum coherences are very, very fragile. Um, they disappear very easily. And so if you have any noise in the system, it destroys those correlations uh, and the entanglement. This is a very simplistic picture. And noise being like temperatures that are like over absolute zero, basically, right? It could be so many different things. Uh, temperature, uh, noise in the lasers you're using to control your things. I mean, I, I'll, I'll let Jonathan and Jan speak about the nature of the noise, but it's really um, very technical, gets very technical very quickly and very detailed. And um, yeah, however, I will point out that there are, there's hope, um, for example, um, and maybe we won't get to talk about things other than quantum computing here today, but let me just mention clocks, atomic clocks. So those are quantum objects as well. Um, and yet we have managed to engineer clocks in the lab. Today, the best clock is so precise that it would be off by a fraction of a second over the lifetime of the universe. We're talking 14 billion years. Okay, so that's the kind of precision we're talking about. So, and that is by combating noise in the system. Um, so there is hope we have, you know, it just takes time to, to get there. Jonathan and Jan, would you like to comment? So we're already, I guess, good enough at reducing noise that we can measure time down to, you know, seconds on the universe. And we could, I think we could talk for a long time on why that's cool for GPS and for optical measurements and for things where that like split second of a nanosecond matters. But um, leave it to you for guys for other noise and challenges that you're addressing. Well, I don't know if it becomes too technical now if I give a speech about noise and if, if the audience is really interested in this. So for, for me, <laughs> The, the, of course, there are all kinds of technical questions, but we have very good engineers and, and people thinking about this, and, and I'm very confident that they figure things out. The, the question is, for me, more like we have no or we see these roadmaps, um, and let's say there is a linear development in, in the technology. For me, and I guess for most other startups, the question really is, okay, how can we be disruptive there and, and make a, a sudden jump and, and in this way get ahead? And, and, and these are, I think, the, the questions that we are working on. Um, and of course, we have um, also um, in, in our company some ideas on how to go different ways than the standard path, let's say that the big corporates are going and, and in this way speeding up um, and then on the other hand, of course, we need to get all of this financed. Um, uh, and um, also there, I think we need to have, or at least 
we we try to go some um, alternative routes and, and we have been discussing for example um, should it be cloud computing and i agree in the end this is the most scalable way but at the moment where the, these systems not yet really deliver any business advantage why would actually then so many companies use the cloud um, and there actually we see at the moment a need um, of real systems on the ground in the big research centers and people are willing to pay a lot of money. I mean, in, in Germany, a system was sold for more than 40 million. Finland bought one for 21 million, at least for our companies. These are quite big sums. And, and this is why we say, OK, we, we have ideas how to speed it up and we have ideas how to finance it and, and we combine this. Um, and then at some point we will have the breakthrough and, and get there. Um, and, and people will figure out um, noise problems and, and all of this. Um, but I think what we really need are these disruptive ideas that give an order of magnitude here or there. Thanks. I, I like the price tags. Actually, I haven't heard. I hadn't heard uh, specific price tags around computers, quantum computers yet. So I just have to, you know, save twenty million dollars and then I can buy one. Great. Good and to know. The, the the price tag actually matters. You know, in our venture world, if if there isn't a billion dollars of revenue, pretty tangibly available in the next three years, four years. It's it's kind of not a venture backable company in in the modern you know kind of sense of it, so I'm wondering if the market is just I, I can't remember who mentioned Amazon Web Services and some of the other elements that are sort of adjunct placeholders until we we quote get there because so much of this feels like we're on the edge of something really cool, but but it needs to be easier to use and I can't remember who asked from the audience. But it was about a standard language and like easy to navigate systems for, you know, dealing with the entropy that's, you know, endemic to qubits, which is a very different world than bits and bytes and so on. Um, there's endless research. Gosh, if I were a 20 year old college student today, I sure know what I do my PhD in. Uh, there are so many furtive areas. So let me kind of turn that question to you guys and gals. If you were 20 today and you were going to do your PhD thesis over the next, I don't know, call it four or five years, what what area would you tackle? What's what's within that realm of being like ready for prime time? So when you get up there to defend your thesis, uh, you don't get bludgeoned to death with uh, professorial baseball bats. So Tatiana, how about you? <laughs> I have a 20 year old son who is um, <laughs> who wants to do quantum computing. No kidding. I'm, I'm not, not a, I don't know. He didn't get it from me, but uh, probably did to some extent. But I mean, I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, I'm a physicist and there's so many, there's still in, in this field of quantum information, there's still so much to do uh, that can give you a really fantastic PhD thesis. Uh, I don't think that's what you're asking, really. Um, but outside of quantum, there's a lot of a lot of a, a lot of wonderful science to do. So this is a non-answer. Uh, I apologize, um, but uh, it, I definitely think that quantum information, quantum computing, quantum sensing, uh, clocks, maybe even quantum networking, all of that is on the table. But let me let me hand it off to my fellow panelists here. Um, maybe for a yeah. better answer. I mean, I could say a couple of things, um, you know, that might be interesting. Like, um, uh, you know, like one thing that's kind of true is that our, our industry, and I think most, most quantum computing companies, when we advertise jobs, we're now advertising this job title, quantum engineer. And there's kind of not really, I mean, maybe there is somewhere, but you know, there's not really like a degree in quantum engineering. And so a lot of times it's experimental physicists or chemists or like engineers. Um, so, I mean, one thing is that like kind of understanding, like if, if you want to come in and work on like quantum mechanical or quantum computing hardware, like, you know, at a company like ours, um, there's sort of a set of skills that can be derived from many of these fields that have a lot to do with things. I and mean, of course, general scientific and engineering skills, data analysis, but, you know, deal dealing with like, yeah, dealing with things like a lot of instrumentation, noise, um, you know, and generally, generally, I think any any sort of foothold into science where you're dealing with something quantum mechanical, honestly, whether that's in physics or engineering or chemistry, would be a way to get foothold into 
working on like the actual hardware of what we're doing. I mean, if you're talking about actually working on developing algorithms and applications, that's, that's sort of a different track, which is more on the theoretical chemistry uh, and physics side. Um, yeah, I, I guess, but, but I guess what, what I would mainly say is, yeah, like I, maybe people should be aware of that there's kind of, it feels like this new, new sort of job title has come into existence called quantum engineering. And it's sort of worth thinking about how you can, in an interdisciplinary way, if you really wanna get into this field in sort of an interdisciplinary way, like connect to all those different skill sets as you're going through your training in grad school or, or wherever. I can maybe, if, I, if you allow me, add something here because this was also new to me. Of course you can um, somehow approach quantum either from the experimental physics side where I come from or from the computer science side, and, and this is obvious. But actually now um, during the time I had two, two interesting interactions. One was actually with a um, professor in arts and they're, they're looking into quantum because they're interested in this concept that observing something changes the object. So they have actually PhD students working in art, thinking about quantum. This is what I found interesting. And now most recently I had a, a longer discussion with someone from the school of management and it was about innovation management. And they have two PhD students thinking about actually how to make a sustainable business model for, for quantum as a deep tech example. So actually nowadays you can approach quantum from, from all sides, um, despite the, the, the typical um, either physicist or a computer science. And probably in the future, we will see even more angles that are looking at, at quantum. So, so maybe just double clipping a little bit more on that technology to overcome the current limitations in quantum computers. Do we need better lasers, better cryostats, so things that keep things really cold? Do we need better material science to, I don't know, play games with that? Do we need better programmers? Do we need people to write chemistry equations better so that you can actually use 30 qubits to solve them? Better VCs. (laughs) (laughs) We're trying. (laughs) This is an interesting question because, um, you know, like part of the answer is it depends on what technology you work, you're working on. Like a lot of what we're doing uh, at Atom Computing has been enabled by newer, like better lasers over the last decade and more generally optical systems that can do things. And I know that probably doesn't matter at all to Jan because, but it's interesting because even though like at a very high level, um, the sort of quantum computing programs and algorithms all could look the same if you're running them on a universal quantum computer, the actual underlying physics is very different. So uh, from the perspective of atom computing, yeah, like always new ways, like instrumentation and technology, like enabling technologies around um, optics and lasers. And to be honest, um, like Tatiana mentioned earlier, uh, atomic clocks, like a lot of the technology that was developed for atomic clocks. What is an atomic clock? We got to explain this to people. (laughs) Can somebody explain atomic clocks? I mean, basically using um, using some of the quantum mechanical pro- I mean, using using something that's like a qubit um, uh, as a frequency standard um, or as a time standard because they, uh, you got an if- electron or an atom or something, and it's vibrating somehow, and you're measuring how fast it's vibrating. Yeah, I mean, it's at least for the ones that you know, the ones that are I'm more familiar with, like not necessarily vibration, but um, I guess um, what it really comes down to is that there's atoms of energy levels um, in the right kind of environment. The difference in energy between two particular levels is extremely well-defined and energy is, can be converted to frequency basically. So that's the other way of saying is that the frequency of the transition is very well-defined. And when I talk about two level, two levels that have a really, really stable, you know, uh, and well-defined frequency. I'm describing something that sounds a lot like a, a qubit, basically. Um, but you know, the atomic clock community um, has basically. I mean, some of the most advanced atomic clocks uh, and best performing really are sort of the marriage of like the really great properties of the atoms with the really great properties of modern lasers, and these two things work together to create incredibly stable timekeeping sources, and. <laughs> And the point, yeah, and just the, the, the final point is that a lot of the technology, enabling technologies that came out of that world over the last 15, 20 years has made a lot of what we do possible. 
Awesome. Thank you, Jonathan. That was that was really cool. Um, and Jan, I know you're solving totally different problems. So what, what problems uh, need to be overcome for a useful superconducting yeah. qubit computer? I think, of course, we can always build better devices and of course, more quality is always there. But also something that we should keep in mind actually is the scalability from all aspects. I, I don't know how much a laser costs that John, Jonathan is buying, but at least the microwave stuff that we are buying is quite expensive. And then if we talk about million qubits, we need million of those. And and then the numbers- Wait, a million become... like microwave ovens? Like um, when, when you say microwaves, what? Uh... Uh, sorry, no, okay. So basically the technology that we are using it operates at the frequency that is the same as in your microwave oven, but we don't have the ovens, just the generators for these things. And, and these can be quite expensive because they need to be high quality. And I think developing something, um, for example, that is smaller, consumes less energy, or cheaper, um, is also actually a valid business model. I don't know if you have this saying in English, but this, that if there's a gold rush, you want to sell the showers, right? So the guys who are selling the, um, the microwave um, sources, I think this is something that really scales. Um, so I think this is also, in, in, when we talk about enabling technologies, it's, it's very important that we don't forget these things. Um, and, and then something else that I usually mention is that also what we need much more um, is good people. So there is already now such a shortage um, on the talent pool. Um, and those who are close to, to the places where you have good universities or, or other educational uh, centers, I think this is really a strategic advantage. Um, and, and this is something, I guess, also just, it's a, a race also for the best people um, out there. Great. Um, Tashana, do you have anything to add to this uh, barrier lowering why now question before we go to maybe one more? Why don't we go to the next one? Okay, well, I, I'm, we're, we're all, I think, loving Owen West's question. Um, can you do a lightning round predicting disruptive tech, like Jan mentioned? Uh, what big impact changes will trigger um, an explosion in quantum applications? Uh, so for example, the traffic engineering uh, example you gave, what other, what other solving this problem, all of a sudden, Amazon Web Services is going to have to buy 50 of these things, 200 of these things, I don't know, and it's really going to take off. What are the big problems? I mean, it's, a, it's a tricky question, as I think Tatjana mentioned, or, I mean, or maybe to frame the question a little better, like, you know, I, I think the people on this call, like, are heavily focused on building sort of the hardware that enables this. Um, there's also a community, I mean, that we're connected to, but like who spend most of their effort on understanding what these applications are. And so I guess I'm starting out with a bit of a non-answer, but then I'll, I'll give you my opinions after that. I mean, so it's sort of discover, like it's still an active area of research to discover what is possible. And Tatiana uses acronym NISC, I'll say it again, noisy intermediate scale quantum, which is basically, you know, tens to hundreds of qubits and errors that are not corrected, you know? And so like, what is possible? What is useful in this era? What, what can we really do that has value before we get to the larger, you know, fault tolerant uh, computers? And so first of all, yeah, I think it's an active area of research. Um, the people more on the algorithm side are discovering more every year. Um, I, I think optimization and chemistry, the ones we said before, I, I think those really are, um, the places I look the most when I'm thinking about some of the applications that might come along first. I mean, you mentioned nitrogen fixation. Generally, you know, enzymes, generally like, I'm gonna get a little technical, generally, generally molecules that have correlated electrons, electrons that Your interact with, <laughs> electrons that interact with each other in a quantum mechanical way that's not easy to define, you know, for example. What, what types of molecules can you give us like th your three favorite molecules that fit that description? Oh, I, I don't know if I can get three off the top of my head, okay, but like, one. I don't know, like, like ones that have like, you know, larger molecules that have like a metal, metal center in it. And like in the vicinity of the metal, the electrons are behaving in a little bit more quantum, like correlated way that sort of defeats uh, classical quantum, sorry, classical chemistry simulations aren't able to handle those as well. So like photosynthesis, right? There, there's a metal center there. Um, I'm trying to remember. I don't know as much specifically about photosynthesis, to be honest, but, but yeah, I mean, larger molecules that have a smaller, like, metal center in it, like, would be a good candidate for, like, using quantum computing to, like, nearer term quantum computing to try to understand the behavior in that particular area of the molecule, then combined with classical computing to handle the rest of it, for example. Okay, cool. 
Okay, so the, the other two, same question, and maybe what is the what is the first problem, but what is one that by maybe 2030 or 2035 that it's just going to blow up, so near term and then moonshot? Do you want to stop, Tatiana? Or? Go ahead, Jan. I'll okay, so for me, I, I think it makes sense to separate those two because my, at least my feeling is that the, the first one, it will be a problem where people um, care a lot about already a little bit of advantage in time. Um, so for me, there are two types of problems. The ones that we cannot solve at all. And of course, these are the great and exciting ones. But then there are those types of problems where maybe you just gain a little bit of time. And then you have to ask the question for whom, for example, would this be relevant? And then we come back to these problems, for example, of option pricing. Or so if you are a little bit faster or better than, than someone else, you already have a benefit. Or for example, um, something that we're currently working on is in and we used the acronym before the NMR imaging. So the imaging in, in healthcare, um, where basically um, it, it costs a lot of time to operate these big uh, machines. And if you can put twice as, as many um, people um, in there, actually you have a business benefit. So for me, these problems where already with a small um, improvement, you generate value. I think these will be the first ones. But then of course, the ones that we are really excited for for are these ones that really change the world uh, where maybe we, we, we find a new uh, drug or a, a new material that really um, changes the world. So I think it, it makes sense to differentiate those two. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, similarly, um, um, let's talk about optimization, which is something that, that um, uh, I'm, I'm currently working in, in, in that uh, domain. Um, and I think the first step is, as Jan points out, that, to uh, demonstrate, um, we call it quantum advantage, to demonstrate that a quantum processor, even a noisy one, uh, can do something uh, faster than the best classical heuristic algorithm and processor for that size of the problem. So that the, that the, that the, um, uh, that the scaling with the size of the problem is favorable. Uh, for quantum versus classical computers, even though you're looking at a small problem, not a useful problem, but something that 200 qubits or a couple hundred qubits can solve, right? Uh, so that's that's really the first step. And from there, then figuring out how to apply that little quantum advantage, I don't know how little it's going to be or big, but how to apply that to actually useful and big problems. Can we decompose big problems into smaller parts that we can then use these limited quantum computers, quantum devices to, um, to solve the big problem and still have the advantage. So that's something that's the approach that we're taking in, in the program that, that, um, that I created and that I'm running. Um, but another big breakthrough, I think, in, in sort of stepping back to uh, maybe the bigger picture here and the ultimate goal, don't forget, is fault tolerant universal quantum computer, which we don't know when that's gonna be, um, probably decades away, who knows. But a big breakthrough there would be in addition to, you know, bigger and better qubits um, is better quantum error correction um, methods right now. So you need quantum error correction in order to have fault tolerance and universality, okay? Uh, and right now, in order to get, um, you know, it's typically per one logical, one quantum, er one error corrected qubit requires something like on the order of 10,000 or more qubits, physical qubits. It's a big, big overhead. Can we come up with more efficient? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for instance, to solve a, a nitrogen fixation problem on a fault tolerant quantum computer, uh, uh, one needs, okay, in that particular case, one needs only uh, something like um, on the order of 100 logical qubits, but that's, now you're talking um, a million, 100 right? 100 times 10,000. Uh-huh, a million. Yep. Yeah. Okay. A million physical qubits. Plus you need many, 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 something like 10 to the 14 gates or something like that. So, so we need better quantum error correction, uh, more efficient quantum error correction uh, methods that would be a huge breakthrough. Okay. So with that uh, optimistic ending that we need a million qubits, <laughs> we're at a couple hundred, uh, we'll have to check back in with you guys in, in, in a 
little bit, couple months, couple years on uh, how it's going. And just really want to thank everybody for your time and checking in and, and going on this journey with us. Um, please, you know, reach out to any of our panelists if you have more questions. I'm going to volunteer them for that. Hopefully they will not hate me for that. Um, and just thank you everybody again. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Great Bye. Talk to you. Bye.